life in the country, which everybody says, everybody has a right to participate and do what they feel like expression, but you know, don't ask the nation to enlist and make right through a constitutional amendment. And you know, this issue is a very serious one. And uh, it, this issue is going to produce, as it is in America right now, some mm -hmm. very difficult questions for democracy. Uh, these kinds of issues test the very foundations of the democratic process because it even brings into question whether democracy is the most effective and efficient form of government. Mm -hmm. uh, democracy has some defects. Oh, no question about and uh, the more I think about democracy, the more the defects seem to manifest themselves. Because you cannot have freedom without law. Now, I want you to think about this. How free can you get mm -hmm. without some boundaries? Mm -hmm. limits. 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 Limits to everything. And yet, democracy purports that its goal is freedom. Freedom. And, mm -hmm. you know, could you imagine mm -hmm. being free to drive anywhere, anyhow, without red lights? I mean, I could decide that my individual right to run a red light can be protected by the more democratic process. Mm -hmm. I have an individual right to decide to run a red light. And I can take that to court. The democratic process says that you must not infringe on my personal individual rights. Now, I, I, I'm violating the law you created, right. but I have a right to do that if the democratic principle plays out. So we get some problems. Uh, and I think concerning the issue of homosexuality and lesbianism uh, as a national issue, I think we need to take this debate away from religion. That's key. Uh, I am in the process of completing a series, and I'm still in the series. Every Sunday evening, it'll be another three or four sessions. And I've taken this issue on to, first of all, address it as an issue that is important to national concern, an issue important to family structure, an issue important to our social and cultural development, an issue important to our economic environment as well, and then its spiritual implications. And uh, the Bible gives us clear, explicit guidelines concerning homosexuality. There's no question about the biblical context of it. I think that the issues are wider, though. Uh, the, the debate should not be between homosexuals and religious people. Right. But I think they like it that way because then they can discount religion as being narrow-minded, bigot, uh, you know, uh, want to impose religion on people. This issue has nothing to do with religion. Nothing to do with religion. And if you leave it in the arena of religion, then the people who address it from a religious perspective will lose. Because democracy will take care of that. Homosexuality is not a religious issue. Homosexuality is a scientific and a natural issue. It's an issue of nature. And homosexuality is a violation of nature, and therefore, it's a violation of the moral law. Notice, I've made a statement just now and never mentioned religion. Let me say it again. Homosexuality is a violation of nature and a violation of moral law. That is why religion gets involved, not because it's a religious issue, but because it's a moral issue. Mm -hmm. And religion which deals with spiritual issues from which moral convictions are derived they get involved because of that. But this issue of homosexuality and lesbianism is not a religious issue. Mm -hmm. Morality, for example, Steve, is a product of the, con of, the con of the conscientious creative process of the creator. Matter of fact, when we talk about morality, we talk about what is right or what is wrong. Morality has to do with what is good and what is bad or what is just and what is fair. Morality deals with that. All true morality must have a moral compass. It has to have a fundamental anchor by which it measures itself. There's no morality without an anchor. There has to be some reference for morality to exist. In other words, you get your conviction from somewhere. Yeah. You just can't believe out of nothing. And then thirdly, there is, there is morality, but there cannot be morality without absolutes. You have to have a reference. It's like it's like a ship that's going somewhere to a destination. It must have a reference point. You cannot just drift in life without some reference. That's what Lighthouse is for. Uh, Stephen Covey in his book, The Seven Habits, 
of effective people. He makes a statement about principles that I thought was very unique. It was very true. He said principles are like lighthouses. Uh, they don't move, you know. And he tells a story about these two ships that are floating in the ocean, uh, two captains up north who were doing military exercises. Up there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the fog came down, they couldn't see each other. And uh, one of them, you know, they were kind of uh, enemy ships, Russians and the US ships. And uh, they saw each other on the radar and they, and they said, you know, they sent a signal, to, you know, those lights they used to send a light. Right, sure. And they sent a light out, the light said, uh, uh, you know, change your course three degrees because you want a cushion course with me. The other guy sent a light back, signal back and says, you change your course three degrees or you will be colliding with me. And the other guy sent another message back and said, don't you know who I am? I am Admiral so-and-so from the USS so-and-so and that. -so and -and -so. You better change your course, otherwise you will collide with me. Mm -hmm. The other guy sent another message back and said, do you know who I am? You know, etc. Anyhow, then the signals and signaling stopped. After about an hour, hour has passed, he saw another light in the fog and he sent a message. He says, uh, when the commission walks with me, please move three degrees to, to the right so we don't collide. The other guy sent a message back says, you move three degrees or you will collide with me. And the captain sent back another signal and said, don't you know who I am? <laughs> I am the you know, rare admiral so-and-so mm -hmm. and I got all these, these mm -hmm. status and degrees. Mm -hmm. You better move uh, three degrees, otherwise I will collide with you. And the other guy sent a message back says, you move three degrees or you will collide with me. And by this time, the Admiral was very angry. So he sent back all his credentials, explained who he was, how much experience he has, how awesome, how many degrees he got in college. And, mm -hmm. you know, don't you know who I am? You better move, otherwise I'll pull you out of the water. And the other guy says, if you don't change three degrees, you will collide with me. And by this time, the Admiral is happy. He says, look, I'm just going to blow you out of the water. I'm a larger ship than you. I'm going to wipe you out. The other guy sent a message back, says, and I am a lighthouse. <laughs> now, <laughs> <laughs> Immediately, the admiral changed degrees, of course. No question. See, the, the lighthouse is that way. When you violate a principle, you don't destroy a principle. It destroys you. You don't need to destroy people who violate nature. Nature has its own built-in self-destruction. So when you talk about morality, morality is built naturally in nature. You cannot change the principles that God placed in nature. And this is the way we approach this issue. See, uh, for example, natural law provides its own absolutes. Gravity is a natural law. You can go up on a 10-story building and say, I defy, I hate gravity, I, I curse it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to jump at this building, I don't care what they say, I hate it. Gravity doesn't care, you jump, so I'm going to go to the ground. Okay, so natural laws have their own built-in judgment. Mm -hmm. And that is why a person can decide to be or do anything they want in life. My concern is when they begin to attempt to make that, first of all, legal, mm -hmm. and then to make it nationally palatable, right. and then to impose it as being acceptable Absolutely. upon our nature, yeah. uh, as a nation, and then to accept it as our culture. See, and I think this is where our government needs to get involved here, and I'm going to talk about government in a minute, because I think our government is too quiet, and, uh, and I'm concerned about that. But morality provides the principles by which we as nat nature is to function. And the principles built into our nature protect us. Morality exists to protect and preserve the purpose for something. When morality is ignored, purpose is destroyed. When, when we violate natural law, it is a violation of moral law. When we violate natural law, it results in destruction of nature itself. Yes. Keep in mind, you can be fined, Steve, for polluting the ocean. You can be fined for polluting the air. You can be fined for polluting the forest or destroying certain animals. In other words, man somehow consciously knows that there are some laws in nature that you gotta protect and respect. Now, the government of the United States and the Bahamas, of course, have made some laws to protect some birds. I mean, there's some parity of yeah, the can't can touch, that's okay. correct. In other words, the government does make judgments. And those judgments are based on sound moral law. There, there's such a thing as the, the as, as uh, what do we call, okay, when the Exxon tanker hit that, that rock in the northern part of Alaska, mm -hmm. and all that oil spilled, they call that an immoral act in courts. Now, how can you spill oil and it becomes a moral issue? Because the oil affects the ecological system, 
it destroys the future of that whole region. People get poisoned, the fish dying, the birds can't find nesting. They destroy that whole. So the government fined the Exxon Company billion of dollars right. to clean that thing up. Why? They call it environmentally immoral. Now, at least the government has sense enough to pass laws to protect the birds. But they wouldn't pass laws to protect the morality of the sanity of my body. Let me drive it home this way. Absolutes provide an alternative to ambiguity. We need to have a life in our nation that is not vague. And faith confronts because it suggests moral absolutes. And that's why the, the religious people gets involved in this thing. Because we deal with absolutes. You cannot have moral morality without absolutes. And the need for absolutes, morality is the is what I call the 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 arbiter of our lives, and it saves us from living a neutral existence. You know, just drifting around. We need to decide what kind of country we're going to have, or decide what kind of country we're not going to have. We just can't just say, okay, we accept everything. You cannot accept everything. We just all can't just get along. There is no freedom without law. Mm -hmm. See. And otherwise, we might as well have what we call anarchy in our country, where everyone does what they want, when they want, how they want. Now, fundamentally speaking, let's talk about homosexuality at its base fundamental difficulty. God's intent when he created the human body is very, very simple. Everything in creation exists to provide a certain function. The birds the cow, the dogs, the cats, the rats, the maggots, the sun, the trees, everything provides a service to the ecological system. In other words, God created nothing without a purpose. Everything has a purpose in it. It is designed to perform a certain function. Your eyes were performed not to hear. They were designed to see. Your nose were designed to smell and to be sensitive to, to scent. And that's natural. You can discern scent. Your, your, your ear was designed specifically to hear, not to speak, not to see. And everything in your body is designed that way. You know, and uh, my heart is designed to pump blood. My lungs is designed to take in air, which is oxygen, and to release carbon dioxide. My, that's all my lungs. My lungs don't do anything else. It is focused on its purpose. My heart pumps blood around the body. That's all it does. That's its purpose. It's a function. It's an organ. My intestines, it absorbs food, extracts poisons, sends it to the liver. The liver cleanses the blood. The kidneys cleanse the fluids in my body. Everything knows what the purpose is. Then the end of my the end of my colon is my rectum. My rectum is designed to excrete garbage. Now, so everything in my body is designed for a reason. You cannot pass a law to change the purpose of my heart. No government can pass the change. Okay, now that we now turn the heart into a lung. You can't do that. No parliament member can sit down with a listen. No majority vote can change the purpose of my lungs. It's very important. No majority vote in parliament can change the purpose of my nose. See, that's when that's when that is when um, government becomes a problem. Because when government attempts to redefine nature then government is attempting to take the place of God. It's impossible for you to pass a law against nature, or to pass a law against gravity, or to pass a law against my eyes. We now are going to make the eyes ears. We have a 90% majority vote in Parliament to change the eyes to ears. The eyes doesn't care. It still sees. Well, my rectum was designed for one purpose. No law can change that. Now, you can say, well, I love the eyes. The eyes still doesn't care. Well, because I have compassion for the eyes, the eyes still doesn't care. Uh, well, you know, I have a, an affinity for eyes to hear. The eyes still sees. So whatever argument you use, you cannot change the nature of God's design for function. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about these issues, this is not really a religious issue. And it's not even a debate for government. If someone wants to use their eyes for a different purpose, we shouldn't pass a law to so accommodate that. That's but a will, personal decision. But they will suffer the consequences. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. If you want to use your ears to pour alcohol down it, you can do that. You mm -hmm. can pour acid into your ears. That's a private personal decision. But don't make the country decide to give a law on the books to give you 
matter of fact, to give that dignity right. and say that is legal for yeah, you to they do want, They want it to be dignified, and so they need the approval and the appreciation and the endorsement, so, so to speak, from the powers that be in the political front. Or even the church, if, if you will. You know, they, they need someone to endorse this, to, to validate uh, this uh, thing and dignify what is happening. That's why it has become a national debate of sorts. But I, yeah. I take your point. It is not a religious issue. It definitely I, I take your point. But the, the, but the religious grouping, uh, they're the moral gatekeepers. And as a result of that, they must be involved in trying to make sure that morality is what it is and what it ought to be in a country. Especially when we have people Absolutely. who are pushing this agenda that, you know, listen, um, we would like to be classified and grouped in your constitutional reform. We would like to be grouped with the people who have a disability, uh, whether it be by nature or by an accident or whatever. But we want to be classified in a group uh, where there is, they're considered a minority uh, because of the color of their skin, they're black, uh, the next one is Chinese or whatever, and they consider a uh, minority. We want to, as homosexuals and lesbians, to be grouped in that uh, that grouping so that uh, when this law passes or if this is adopted for, for the amendments into the Constitution, then we believe that people will no longer be discriminated against and we can make the same lobbies as, say, the, dis the, the disabled person who says that, you know, when I go to the bank, there's no smooth walk for me to get up and I can't push my wheelchair up. And so the bank must now say, okay, we better fix that. Here's a, here's a driveway for the disabled. Uh, you go to the big food stores, you go to the malls, you see the, a lot of parking. I don't even discuss this issue. But see, what I'm saying is that yeah, this, is, this that. is what is being sorted and we right. have to deal with it. And you know, Steve, there is definitely an agenda in high places. And it's impossible for anyone to proceed with discussing this issue without first getting rid of the preamble. Mm -hmm. Because again, there's no morality or absolutes. And the preamble in our constitution states very clearly a reference to some absolutes. In order for you to tamper with, with this issue, you have to get rid of that absolute. And that's very dangerous. Because if you remove the absolute, you've opened the door to a gate of, of unrestricted foolishness. Not just for this issue, many other issues. Mm -hmm. That commitment that we have constitutionally to govern ourselves based on certain absolute values and moral standards is the best thing that we've ever done because it at least gives our country a reference. Mm -hmm. See, and democracy cannot exist without a reference. Now, let, now, since we have in our constitution at the moment, and I, I am going to believe it's going to stay there, a reference to the historic Christian faith, principles, and values as our reference, then let me read from the biblical text for all of our listeners to hear. I'm going to read this. See, talk about what the Bible doesn't say. I'm going to read a quote from the Bible, what the Bible says about homosexuality and lesbianism and other immoral acts. Here's what it says. Leviticus 18, verse 22. I read to verse 29. It says, Do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable. By the way, before I finish reading, let me just say this. These laws were given to Moses not to create a religion. Moses was not a priest. Moses was a prime minister. He was a president. He founded a nation. This is important. These laws are not religious laws. These were laws given to Moses to create a nation out of slaves. In other words, God wanted to produce a national entity. And God, the creator, knows his creation. And he says, look, there are certain behaviors and activities that will not be helpful for national development. So Moses placed these as planks into the foundation of national development. I repeat this again. Moses was not a religious man. He was not building a religion. And he was not a priest. He was a politician. He, he ran into another country. He took out a group of slaves and God giving him the formula for a national uh, structure for building a country. We need to see it that way. So when I quote this now, I'm quoting from, these are legal laws. Right, right. God said, Moses, remember this. Tell them, okay. do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable. Number two, 
Do not have sex relationships with an animal or defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal or to have sex relationships with an animal. This is perversion. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Now, he is telling Moses, look, the reason why the nations that, that I am driving out from their land is being driven out is because of their immoral acts. This is what destroyed their countries, he says. Mm -hmm. Verse 25 says, even the land was defiled. So I punished the land for its sins and the land vomited out its inhabitants. I continue with 29. Everyone who does any of these detestable things, such persons must be cut off from their people. Now, they, they, these people who want to practice this are trying to become incorporated into the people. God says, no, have a discrimination. Now, wait a minute. The Bible is teaching discrimination. God says, look, cut them off. Tell them, you behave that way. You are not normal. normal you're not a normal, acceptably part of our community. God is telling them, separate them as community, discriminate against them. Okay, it's very important. Then he says, keep my requirements and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came. In other words, we are importing some behaviors that, or we have conculcated behaviors that are foreign to us. God says, don't adopt them as your own. In other words, homosexuality is not a part of the Bahamian culture. People we commit adultery. We don't make adultery a part of Bahamian culture. It no, should sir. never be accepted. No. It's always it's no different from anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay? We discriminate against drug abusers. Listen, they have a right to stand up and say, you know, the, the law that was passed twenty four hours ago in, in America by the, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court. Because they're saying, look, everyone who was being apprehended by President Bush's law after nine eleven have a right to to uh, to detest that. And to contest it and go to court and get the lawyer. Now that law is messing up the whole thing because now all these uh, presumed terrorists have a right to go to court in America and defend their case. And they may be legitimately uh, uh, terrorists. But the law, see, has opened up this gate. This is what God is saying. There has to be discrimination. Mm -hmm. Another statement, Romans chapter 1, verse 25. He says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the, created, than, the, than the Creator. And it goes on to say, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations to women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Homosexuality. Men committed indecent acts with one with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. God is speaking here. This is from Romans. God says, look, they are committing indecent act. Now, God calls the act indecent. He didn't say they weren't doing it, but let's call it what it is. <laughs> don't, don't call it dignified. Call it indecent, he says. Verse 28. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to depraved minds to do what ought not to be done. In other words, if our country nationally, constitutionally, dignifies this behavior, God will give up on the Bahamas. He'll give it over to our own destruction. And that is why those who are concerned about this issue must address it. Now, this last part I read. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not be, do not be deceived? Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolatrous, nor adulterous, nor male prostitutes, or homosexual offenders will inherit, inherit the kingdom of God. Nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, nor any of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. I like that statement. Because what the writer is saying, you used to be homosexual. But you were washed. I'm reading the Bible. You tell me that this thing was born and this thing. According to scripture, you can be washed from it, delivered from it, and stop behavior. The same way a drug addict can stop taking drugs, be rehabilitated, you can be rehabilitated from the habit of this that draws you to this perversion. That is scripturally sound. It says, you were washed from them, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. I I, I many former homosexuals who are now delivered and free from that behavior. See, homosexuality is it's the sex. You start off innocent with, with, with the first hit. And they give that to you free most of the time. And then after three or four hits, then your body begins to respond to that uh, appetite. The appetite becomes a craving, the craving becomes a habit, habit becomes a habitation, a lifestyle, and most homosexuals are trapped. They can't get out, just like drugs. It's like being caught up in a drug habit where everybody who you know is in it. 
Mm-hmm. Everybody who you whole meet environment, is your, doing it. Your whole exactly. Mm-hmm. So most homosexuals have their own little culture, a subculture with the Bahamas. Listen, and it's so hard. It's just like trying to get out of a gang or out of a drug situation. That's how hard it's to get out of, sex, of homosexuality. Because your friends call you up when you try to leave. They they send you gifts. They 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 they, they, they give you money. They, they they do stuff just like drug addicts do. A drug addict wants you to remain in a habit, uh, forming drug deal I and mean, drug use. For instance, let's say he comes back and gives you a free hit. People do that with homosexuality. They would pay for your mortgage to keep you in the clique. They would give you a, a position on your job, promotion, keep in the clique. Matter of fact, if you want a promotion, then you better line up with the other brothers. In other words, it's, it's a culture. So let's not get in the habit of saying, well, you know, this is where I was born. He wasn't born a drug addict. He wasn't drawn, born a drunkard. He wasn't born homosexuality. It has become a habit that has been so practiced. It's a habitation now. It's a culture. It is. It is so. It's possessed. It possesses you now. And you need, as the scripture says, you need to be delivered from it and washed from it. So this hormonal discussion and all this, you know, the way I was born issue, no way. I think it is definitely uh, people who have had different issues that have been, you know imposed upon their lives, and they have responded incorrectly. And, and, and when you say this, different issues, I, I was reading a book uh, that, that talked about some of this, and uh, some of those different issues that you talked about, or those challenging issues, in, in, in uh, one of those, uh, in, 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 in an individual's early life would be the parenting of uh, uh, a lot of cases. It would be what they would have been exposed to, them, and, and uh, how they would have been, I suppose, coerced uh, in, in this kind of behavior, and encouraged in this kind of thing. A lot of it has to do with, with upbringing. Yeah, you Does know, it not? It's, it's very complicated. Uh, I'm going to be addressing this in about two Sundays from now in the series. I'm going to be talking about why people go into homosexual lifestyles. And uh, one of them that I've done research on is that people are searching for significance. In other words, it's sad when the need for love, acceptance, and approval and significance would cause one to seek these basic human needs through the perversion uh, of that which is beautiful and natural. In other words, some people feel that they are not, that they are uh, abandoned or left out or they feel a need to be accepted. So they can involve in these relationships to feel acceptance. That is one reason why people get involved in sexuality. The second reason I found out is that they search for love after abuse. In other words, many people have been uh, reduced, uh, abused. They've not had success relationships before in their marriages or whatever. In other words, some women may have been abused by men. So she decides, I'm going to go with women from now on. Or a man who's had a bad relationship with women decide, I'm going to go with men. In other words, some of them had traumatic position, uh, relationships that traumatized them, and they tried to solve it by going to same-sex relationships. The third reason why people go into homosexuality is the passion of lust. Many of them are because chosen manner has done what, in other words, they have gone to the limit of their sexual deviation, now they want something different. And, you know, sex is such a, a, a controlling power that if you are involved in pornography, it's like drugs. All of a sudden, you can't get the same satisfaction anymore, so you keep going into more and interesting, yeah. experimental behaviors mm-hmm. to try and achieve the same experience. And you keep getting worse and worse. That's why God mentioned bestiality. Because men and women had become so perverted, they couldn't get satisfaction sexually anymore with other humans, so they started going to animals. Uh, this is the reason why some people go and get involved in these behaviors, because of the passion of lust. I didn't say love, lust. And then thirdly, fourthly, around this experiments. You know, uh, the group of people who get involved in homosexuality, let them be by experimentation, are those who fall victims in, unintentionally to homosexual and lesbians who have put them in a web. In other words, here you are, an innocent man, and you go to be a friend. Your friend gets you involved with a group, and all of a sudden you find yourself being approached by people, and then you get involved in homosexuality. Now, you, in other words, you're not homosexual, you were, you were roped in right. by mm. a person, and then you start experimenting with it. And all of a sudden, you realize that this is a culture, and you get involved in that. Uh, so we must be careful when we start talking about, well, this is the way I was born, or et cetera. Every homosexual listening to me today knows that, that homosexuality was their decision. There was a point where they made a decision. It was, you know, uh, I don't decide to be a male. I was born that way. Uh, you know, my wife didn't decide to be a female. She was born that way. Uh, I don't decide to... To hear, I was born hairy, you know. Uh, when we talk about handicaps, all the, they don't put that in the same class. Well, that's what a, a, person who's, a person who's crippled didn't choose to be crippled. You, see, you, you, you cannot class that person. If a person is black in America or the, or the Bahamas or South Africa, you didn't choose to be black. 
And if you discriminate against me on the basis of my skin, I can't change it. But if I, if I have a law which, re, which protects the morality of our values in our country based on a behavior that you decided, you can decide not to behave that way Precisely. or you break the law. For example, we have a law against the abuse of illegal drugs. You can decide to still take drugs. You can decide not to take it. But you weren't born a drug taker. So you can't class that with, with someone who is in a wheelchair who was born deformed or maybe had an accident or something or had an impediment. That is not something that they can change. I got a question for you, Dr. Miles Monroe, as we talk here on Bahamas Live this morning. And that is, why, why, why aren't we seeing the debate happen at the realistic level that we should see it happen at? As we're doing now. As we're doing. Why, why, why can't we see that? Why, why hasn't that happened? What has nullify the chances of such debates openly in a society like the Bahamas that has its fair share of gays and lesbians in the Bahamas and who are bold enough to come forward and say they want to have these rights and they don't want to be discriminated against. Why haven't we seen the debate at the level that we should see it at so that we can deal with this matter in as a comprehensive way that you have just done so that all may understand and we can get beyond this and and note that this should not even be a consideration for the reform committee of the constitution of the Bahamas. It's a very good question Steve and I and I believe there are a number of reasons it could be I'm not sure of all of them but I believe it could be number one I believe that we become too emotional about these issues and we don't think them through number two we are ignorant about them in, in all the, in the, the context of them whether it is scientific or natural or hormonal or emotional or psychological or whatever, we, we need to do more research on it. I think uh, uh, my friend, uh, who I really appreciate, has a book out, and uh, this book I think I would recommend to everybody. It's called True Union in the Body, and uh, Bishop uh, Drexel Gomez has put this book together with a number of uh, issues in it, and it's a very good book that addresses homosexuality from a very, very sound, reasonable point of view. And I'd like to recommend that book to everyone, get a copy of it. It's called True Union in the Body, and I think he did a great job in that. But let me just say this uh, to, res to respond to your question. I also believe it's because people think, again, that homosexual and lesbian lifestyle is a religious issue. It's not a religious issue. And I think that is why when you talk about, it, this this is an issue that has to do with our very own uh, nature. Not culture, but nature first. Yeah, it is, you know, in the book of Romans, it is called unnatural. Very important. The Bible doesn't, doesn't call it just perversion, it calls it unnatural. Unnatural is the word nature. It goes against the nature of things. See, for example, uh, this discussion of same-sex marriage, and all that, that, that is ridiculous. The, the term doesn't even make sense. Same-sex marriage. The three words don't go together. Mm -hmm. Same-sex cannot be marriage. Because marriage implies the capability to produce children and to have a family. It cannot happen. Impossible. So we shouldn't even be using the term in our country. Now, other countries, it's fine. I don't care what they do. But in the Bahamas, let's be at least more intelligent than those people. Those terms don't go together. You can call it same-sex arrangements, same-sex cohabitation, but don't call it same-sex marriage because marriage implies a union that produces offspring and that that offspring is cared for by this union within the context of a psychological incubator that is sound for that person. For example, if you bring up a boy with two men there will be psychological damage. No way, don't tell me it ain't going to be. You don't even know it's going to be, so don't, don't tell me to try to defend it. But it's impossible because there are certain things that a female brings to a boy's life that a male cannot bring, period. And there are certain things that a male brings that a woman cannot bring, period. So don't discuss that. That's why in order to produce a child, you need a male and female. The creator designed in such a way that in order to produce it, you even need the two different elements. Understood. Because in his intent was whatever they bring to that product is necessary. So you can adopt all the children you want. You can never have what I call a family. You can have uh, a, a group 
but don't call it family in the context of the nature of family. Now, I'm not quoting scripture anymore. Let's deal with nature. To produce a baby, you need a male and a female, which means nature has already dictated its own laws. You need a male female to conceive it, to incubate it, and to, 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 to nurture that product. Therefore, there's no such sound, natural thing as same-sex marriage or same-sex families. It doesn't exist. Now, if you want to do that, let's call it perversion. Let's call it a perversion, a perverted view of the ideal. Because the ideal is what nature dictates. If you violate nature, let's call it what it is. It is a perversion of the ideal. Now, I can accept that. Okay? At least when I see you, I can say, oh, you are, you are one of the perverted ones. No problem. I don't mind telling you that. If that's what you decide. Listen, if you want to be a homosexual, go ahead and be it. But don't try to dignify it and make it a legal entity in our country. Because it is unnatural and the government has a responsibility to protect nature. Now they're protecting parrots and they're ignoring their own rectum. <laughs> Let me put it this way. <laughs> See, the problem I have with, the, with, with the homosexuality in the context of the law mm -hmm. and all this discussion about the reform is this. It is very disconcerting when prominent ministers come forward to defend homosexuality and same-sex marriages. And they claim that any opposition to such union would be considered discrimination. I got a problem with that. Question, why do gays and lesbians, or whatever they call themselves, want the church's blessing? And they want it. Why do they want to even have gay churches? I mean, you can do this stuff without God. Let me tell you why they want it. They're trying to give it dignity and sanctity. See, and so that is why 70 bishops decided to rewrite scripture. Well, they wrote their own scriptures. Yeah, they have their own church. They got their own church. And listen, I ain't got a problem with that, you know. You can have a gay church all you want. Just make sure it ain't associated with Jesus. Because I just read from you from the Bible, the word of Jesus. He said that those who practice such behavior cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And he can't preach the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus Christ is very discriminatory. Jesus discriminates so much against sin. He died to get rid of it. Now you can't get any more committed than against discrimination than that. Mm -hmm. To die to make sure something doesn't continue. Our government, therefore, have no question with regards to what they need to take a position on. See? And let me say this. The principle of democracy is here, here, here are the defects of democracy. And I'm going to read them to you. And this comes in my, my next book sometime in January. First of all, the principle of majority rule is, is, a, is a pillar of democracy. Majority rule. Then also majority, uh, the, the democracy has the concept of the protection of rights. That's fine. It also has uh, the protection of minorities. Okay. Natural law and morality can be at the mercy, therefore, of the majority. Yeah. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. See, if majority decides what's right in a society, then my question is, when we, tell, when we say that the majority is the voice of God, which God are we talking about? Because if the majority votes for my rectum to become sanctified as a legal entity in our culture, and you tell me that that's the voice of God, then God is speaking against his own nature. Impossible. Impossible. Mm -hmm. So let's stop this idea even today of the people's voice is the voice of God. No way. Not unless the people's, the question is where did they get their voice from? See, that's the question. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need absolutes. If the people's voice is coming from an absolute source of truth, then we can say, and that's truth, is agreed to be considered as, as God's truth. Then we can say they're speaking for God. Right. But 70 bishops in a room who claim to represent the God of the Bible, which says that if a man lie with a man is detestable, those 70 bishops ain't getting their reference from that God, from that book, the other God. Okay, so... Now, law and morality must not and cannot at the mercy of the majority. I don't care how people in our country may agree that homosexuality is okay. That is not based on God's law. And therefore, democracy has become God itself. You see, democracy can legitimize wrong. But it can never make it right. I'm going to say it again. Democracy can legitimize something that's wrong, but it can never make it right. See, you can make something legal, but legal is not automatically right. It's absolutely. It's very important. That's why democracy has a defect. 
Because if the majority makes the law or condones something, then majority can dictate and turn wrong into right just by vote. Yeah. Which itself is detestable because you have become God yourself. We put it this way. The people become sovereign when their majority vote violates nature. And you don't want to be in a country where we consider ourselves a measure of all things. Oh what kind of country is this? Democracy without God or absolutes is institutionalized humanism. That's what we get. If we decide that we know that we agree that this thing will be right for us, even though nature says it's wrong, right. we have used the human as the reference for all things and the God. And no matter how much we decide that this is right for us, the natural nature is that it's simply <laughs> just being right. Nature doesn't care. It doesn't care. Absolutely. See, see yes. the pursuit for equality is mm -hmm. more than a spiritual matter, mm -hmm. but rather mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. and economic. And that's why homosexuals really want legality. It's not really spiritual, you know, even though they would like to have the sanctification and their own you know, religious yeah, ideology for that. They want the ideology for that. But they really want the economic and the, and, and the political power in it. You see, because you see, if you and I, homosexuals, we live together, and uh, we decide we have an arrangement, and uh, I have an insurance, okay. and I die, who, did, who gets the insurance, you see? Yeah. I mean, uh, are you my legal <laughs> you know, partner to get my insurance? So this is the issue they're dealing with, right? Now, should the government change the moral code in our country Just to accommodate that? that? I, I, I see your point. My government needs to, to go back to God again and, and discuss some absolutes, yeah. all right? Uh, they would, let me tell you what, the homosexuals would rather see the destruction of the institution of the church for the sake of their objectives. They don't care about the church. Matter of fact, they think right now that I am the most bigoted. I haven't said anything bigoted on this program yet. Everything I said is sound, scientific, and natural. In other words, my rectum is for excretion, period. And no two women can produce a child, period. And my rectum was not made for a penis, period. You know, Fred Price says something on, on, on Sunday that is interesting. He said, two homosexual men involved in sexual intercourse is like a man going out to his cesspit, cutting the pipe and putting his penis in it. They would rather see the church destroyed to achieve the objectives. This, ain't, this is not an issue for the, against the church. The church ain't against homosexuals. The church, is, the church is against the deterioration of the values and the morals for which we've committed ourselves to govern ourselves by as a country. And that's why they're trying to remove that statement the preamble. There is a, a concerted underlying objective uh, an agenda, some in government, and by the way, I speak to all government leaders, I live here, you can't put me out of the country. If we identify that you are one of them who are agitating for the distract, the, 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 the detraction of that, con con that commitment from our constitution, we're going to have to discuss this, whatever that means to you. We're going to talk about this because there, there cannot be democracy without absolutes. Otherwise, we have chaos, and there's no, that's why America is having problems now. See, they just passed a law yesterday which, which prevents parents from restricting their children from pornography <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> what kind of Supreme Court is that? Now, I hate the word Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah. And I don't care if Bahamas or America, you ain't supreme, you, you, you ain't smart enough intellectually to decide what is good or right. Yeah. And you know, no human is. I, I gotta ask you this question as you talk. Very, very interesting uh, conversation here this morning, Dr. Miles Bergo. And of course, I'm very enlightened by all that you have said thus far. And I'm sure that many of our listening audience are, are, are so, so also delighted and enlightened by what you have said. But you know, it, it, it prompts this question, Dr. Miles Bergo. Um, where are we as a people? I mean, how have we been low to sleep? on a very important topic. There are some among us who would have you believe that there is no such debate taking place in our country very subtly and very, very powerfully. 
um, in a class of people, in a grouping, the, the people who make things happen, the power brokers, you may want to call them. <laughs> and, and the small man, those on the outside, the average everyday citizen, uh, goes about in his daily rendezvous trying to pay his bills at BEC and Metallica and water and sewage and so forth and so on, and to stay up with the Joneses, because you know that's a part of the culture too, the show. and also to pay the rent. And yes. In other words, they, they're busy with the daily run. Mm -hmm. These kinds of debate. That's what happened in Massachusetts. Well, dude, that's my point. And I'm there saying. There are some very powerful have churches we, in Massachusetts, and very also non church people who have high morals who don't agree with same sex marriages. But you see, the way the entities that purport to believe in that lifestyle operate is that, first of all, they think they are inte intellectually advanced. I think they are not, because anyone who can interpret a rectum for a sexual organ is not smart to me. I don't care how much big words you use, you're not intelligent. And if any woman can say to me that she is fit to be the sexual part of another woman sexually, you ain't intelligent, that's abuse. That's abuse of your vagina. Pardon my expression, but let's deal with it. Okay, that's not intelligent. You don't need to be intelligent. If you want to be stimulated sexually to send uh, electrodes to your brain to, to have an orga orgasm, mm -hmm. you, could, you could use a paper cup. But don't come to me and tell me that, that you can scientifically prove that it is quite uh, in, the, in, the, in the context of the creator's design that, that two males are born to stimulate each other and to be in love and have sexual pleasure. Are you crazy? You can put your penis in a dog and have pleasure. But don't tell me that that is legitimate, and let's give that dignity, okay? Let me tell you something. Here's what they argue. The, the argument is this. They always say things like, well, you people are not loving. Uh, you, you need to be more open. You need to be more uh, compassionate, right, right, okay? Right, right. Well, let me, let me read a couple of statements. I think it's very interesting. These are taken from the one the, the, the statement that everyone quotes uh, by the Apostle Paul. You know, love is kind, love is etc. Here's my take on it. True love is patient, but is not permissive. True love is kind, but is not careless. True love is good, but not greedy. True love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in what is true. True love protects, but never promotes wrong. True love hopes, but never hates people. True love preserves, but it never perverts. True love is expressed in one statement. Go and sin no more. See, true love has to discriminate. True love doesn't accept everything. If our government, and, and our government, I use the word government again, you know, it's a very vague word, because this word government is, we use too much. Because you see, we, we're talking about different people in there who may even have this problem themselves. So let's put it this way, the authorities are supposed to protect and preserve the people. In other words, they show compassion for people. Uh, there's a statement about government. Let me read the statement about government. It's a very interesting statement about government. It says in the book of Romans 13, the purpose for governments. And I hope every politician listening today listen to this. It says, everyone must submit themselves to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which has been established by God. Important. Who established governments? God. God. Okay. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has established and instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Watch this. But rulers hold no terror to those who do right for the, or those who, but for those who do wrong. In other words, the government has discriminated what is right and wrong. Okay. Watch this. For governments hold no terror to those who do right but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of one in authority, then do what is what? Right. And he will commend you. For he is God's servant. I'm going to read it again. The government is God's servant as an agent of wrath to bring punishment to wrongdoing. The government is not the servant of the people. See, I think uh, in a democracy, we've made the government the servant of the people. Yeah. According to scripture, it's, government. it's supposed to be the, government, the servant of God. The government is supposed to represent God's views, God's values, God's morals. When a government can sit and debate to take God of the Constitution, then what they're saying is we want to, to, to debate the possibility of not representing God anymore. Mm -hmm. 
for representing our own selves. Are we intelligent enough to represent our own selves? Dr. Bas Monroe, isn't it that those uh, persons who are involved in this uh, web of homosexuality, lesbianism, this new lifestyle, this alternative lifestyle, that they are people, I mean, I know it's it's it's, it's across all all of the divide. I don't think it's just the limited people who are involved. But I'm saying that the majority, the whole idea behind this thing, the whole movement is influenced by people with great influence. And people uh, with great influence and, and who have money, in many cases, are able to get their way. That's just the way of the world in many uh, aspects when one is lobbying for something. Those, I'm not intimidated by no, but what I'm saying, like money. But what I'm saying is this, that isn't it isn't it so that the whole idea is perpetrated and perhaps government does not have the wherewithal, the willpower to effectively deal with this issue and to be representatives of God in this issue and moral gatekeepers because the very people who are pushing such an agenda, for instance, uh, when uh, when uh, when uh, Bush was it uh, Clinton uh, was there in the White House and those in San Francisco uh, were saying that this is our man and when he turned around and almost turn his back on them, they said he'll be gone in a minute. Mm -hmm. The point that I'm making is that those with the influence, those with the money and may be a part of this alternative lifestyle, they call a lot of shock in any country they would. And I would believe that governments or any authorities, if you, as you put it, would be basically um, susceptible to them, would be uh, you know, almost as if uh, you know, they can't do what I they feel you, like, I and as a result of it, a lot of things are not served. I understand me. your point, but you see, number one, you don't know that. No, I don't. Okay, so I don't want to give anybody powers that they really have. <laughs> the, the homosexual homo countries country is ain't rich people. We can't assume that. That's number one. Number two, the most powerful institution in this country is the church. Every Monday morning, when you go to the bank, I am sure there's at least close to a billion dollars being deposited. So if if we have true leadership, and some of the folks in the church are homosexuals, okay? And I, I'm aware of that, okay? We're going to deal with that a little later. But I'm talking about genuine kingdom people. There is wealth in this country. That's why when the Pope speaks, everybody gets nervous. So one of the wealthiest institutions in the world is the Catholic Church. The Bahamas has that same power. If the church in this country was to ever unite, <laughs> The government would be at the mercy of, of the dictates of that group. But there's so much money tied up in the banks that belong to church people. Matter of fact, we just need some leaders. First of all, we get backbone, and we get moral standards who don't care about threats of death. Matter of fact, unless you are willing to die, you shouldn't be leading. I'm willing to die. See, because true leadership begins with not discovering something to live for. Something to die for. And that's my case. Yeah, Marcus Garvey says the, the mark of leadership is not only blood, sweat, and tears, but blood, sweat, and even death. Well, he got that from Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Jesus said, a man when the loses life, then he'll say. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, my point is this mm -hmm. it doesn't matter about these, these assumptions that people are making. This is not an issue of, 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 of how much power people get. We cannot sell our morality on the altar of faith of some reprieve. Are you crazy? If a country cannot stand for the sake of its moral fabric and value system that they adhere to as being good for society mm -hmm. and healthy for our unborn children, that group of people should not even be considered a nation. Let me put it this way. Democracy without accountability to God is an exercise in moral roulette. I put it this way, democracy without God is man's worship of himself and his own intelligence. No one, no one in parliament, nobody, none of them are smart enough to rule this country. Nobody in parliament, including the prime minister, is intelligent enough to determine what is good for the life of this country. No one. That's why we need a reference. And that reference is our corporate commitment as a country to the biblical values, because you gotta have a reference. But do we have this corporate commitment? See, we do, it's in our constitution. That's why the element's trying to move it. Listen to this. Democracy cannot succeed without God any more than communism tried to. I'm gonna say that again, because you gotta get that. See, communism is a good idea without God. Communism is a perfect 
perfect eye. It's utopia. <laughs> but they took away the only element that would make it work. And today it's history. Democracy is headed the same way. Because if democracy removes God from the equation, it has become communism reversed. It is man attempting to be free in a community without anchors. You cannot be free without reference. So, when, and that's why they are either trying to remove God or incorporate God. <laughs> so when so when this idea comes around with, can't we all just get along? Impossible. It's the coexistence we of not. trying to incorporate uh, without having to remove it because it may be harder to remove it altogether. Well, let's put it this way. God's context is remove them. In other words, they can be, they can exist, but they cannot be accepted as the norm. So they could coexist, but in their own... Not, yeah, they, they can be tolerated. In other words... And they have been tolerated. Listen, listen let's not take it too far. We know there are drug, drug addicts in this country. Yes. We know that there are number houses in the country. Yep. We know there are prostitution houses in this country. Yep. We don't pass a law to legalize any of them. So if you want to have your home be a center for homosexual activity, that's your business. But don't come out and tell me that you are going to make this the norm, so an acceptable so, and part. We don't accept drug addiction, I mean, uh, you know, drug uh, abuse as a as a norm mm -hmm. because many people are doing it. We don't change the law because many people are doing something. So all this ridiculous argument, but, you know, cold existence. I mean, listen, we, we, we will always discriminate against murder. We always discriminate against thieves. Why? In the law, it gives the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. We didn't invent that. We got that from Moses. So when you start stealing stuff from Moses, but believe in some, you are you, you, you have no integrity. Man. You can't accept Moses' law and say, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery for the national growth. And this is all against the backdrop, folks. Don't think that we are picking and zeroing on them or any grandstanding or a big show. No. The whole idea is that there is an agenda, a place, in place, a foot that wants to make some constitutional changes to our Bahamian constitution. And as a result, let them be. Let's run to the telephone lines this afternoon and take a call from Mrs. Harris. And then we'll take another call from other calls on the line. Go ahead, Mrs. Harris. Mr. Rowe, you're next. Harris. Yes, good afternoon. How are you? Fine, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Interesting. 